Today, our candles are lit to represent the light of Christ in this place. If you have a candle nearby that you would like to light to represent Christ in your home, you're welcome to do that now. In our final week of our No Fear series, we see a story that makes fair-minded people cringe. The story Jesus tells about a fair wage has some reminders for us today. Welcome to worship as we ponder the hard words of Christ. I'm Lynn Bartlow, the pastor here, and as always, it is a joy to welcome you to worship today. My name is Kathleen. Please pray with me. Gracious God, your word surprises, challenges, upsets, and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. Come and find us today wherever we are, however we are. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to see you see as you see and glimpse the kingdom you are bringing in. In Christ's name we pray, amen. One of the names we find in the Bible for God is the word Jehovah. This is also translated Yahweh and is the proper name of God. As we worship today, let us invite Jehovah to guide our time together and our lives. Let us sing. This week, we turn to the words of Jesus teaching us about forgiveness. Hear now the words from Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others lounging around and asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them was also given a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. 
These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Our parable today is bookended with this statement. First, Jesus says it in the end of the previous chapter when addressing Peter. And then again, here in our text today. This is a clear signal that the parable is to be understood as a picture of how God's kingdom turns supposed hierarchies upside down. This parable reminds us that God's kingdom is not about being fair, but about something else. Jesus is approaching the end of his public ministry. He's rounding the corner into the last lap, if you're a race fan. He's about to foretell his death and his resurrection for the third and final time. And shortly after that, he'll ride into Jerusalem in a jubilant procession complete with palm branches and a donkey. Just a few days later, he'll be killed. As the end approaches, the stakes and the tensions are on the rise. In the chapter before this one, one that we skipped, Jesus had a conversation with a rich young man, and Jesus told him to sell everything and follow him. And then Peter asked what they would receive. We left behind everything for you, Jesus. What will we get in return? So Jesus tells a parable. A landowner hires laborers for his vineyard several times over the course of a day and ultimately pays them all with the same daily wage, one denarius, paying the last arrivals first. This causes grumbling among the early arrivers. They don't grumble because they ought to be paid more, but rather they grumble because the late arrivers ought to be paid less. You have made them equal to us. This sounds just like Peter in the previous chapter. He said to Jesus, we've been with you since the beginning. What are, you, what are we going to get that sets, apart, sets us apart from the others? Jesus ultimately tells us three things about God's kingdom and fairness as he tells this parable. The first thing he says is that God's kingdom is not based on an ethic of work and reward. I really don't want to tell you this in the season where we are going to be asking you to serve on committees at the church, but the fact is God's kingdom is not based on the ethic that you get what you work for. Jesus shows us in our story today that it doesn't matter what we've done or how long we have been in service to God. God receives what we have to give. All service is important to God. God's generosity isn't based on what we have done, but God's generosity is based on God's generosity. The end. Like the vineyard worker who comes in at 5 p.m., we don't deserve what we've been given, but God gives out of generosity. God gives not because we earn it, but because God is generous. We see this over and over again throughout Scripture, right? God delivered the people from Pharaoh in Egypt and gave them manna and quail in the wilderness. God promised and God delivered a land flowing with milk and honey to a stiff-necked people. God gave prophets and priests, kings and warriors to lead the people. The Psalms remind us of God's care. In Psalm 8, we see these words, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set into place, what is humankind that you are mindful of us, the Son of Man that you care for him? The psalmist knew God cared for them. God was generous. Jonah knew it too. Jonah refused to go to Nineveh because he knew if he went, they would repent and God would save them. He did not want God to save those people. He didn't want his generous God to change his mind and save his enemy. 
He should be the one to receive God's generosity, not those Ninevites. The older brother knew God's generosity. When the prodigal son came home and the father threw a feast, the older brother grumbled. Why are you being so generous to him? What about me? Sound familiar? This is what the workers were grumbling about. The landowner shouldn't be generous to them. That's not fair. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Jesus' parable demonstrates God's generosity. The challenge is that often we're like Jonah and the older son and the workers who came first. We want God's generosity for us. The second thing our parable teaches us is that our attitudes of resentment towards others keeps us from the kingdom. The parable challenges us not to resent generosity shown to others, but to rejoice in it. Notice the workers who grumbled. They weren't grumbling about fairness. They grumble with a competitive contempt and resentment. They haven't worked as hard as we have. They don't deserve to be equal with us. They judge the late arrivers to be less worthy and they resent the householder's action because it erases the imagined pecking order. You've made them equal to us. Put simply, when the early arrivers look at the late arrivers, they see a them to look down on. Jonah was there too. He became bitter when God did save Nineveh. Instead of being grateful that God had saved a people who had decided to turn their lives around, Jonah grumbled. He looked down on them, the Ninevites, and grumbled that they had become equal to him, receiving equal favor with God. Jonah is a mirror for us, showing how bitter we can become when God shows mercy and generosity to others. Have you found yourself there? Have you seen someone else's good fortune and thought that they didn't deserve it? Have you found yourself like the older son in the, in the prodigal son story, grumbling at the generosity of the father toward the younger son? We see this all the time. It's part of our human nature. It's the younger sibling grumbling because the older sibling gets to stay up longer. It's the older pastor who grumbles when they don't get the better church, but the younger pastor does. It's church members that grumble that the pastor's spending time trying to reach new people on YouTube instead of calling church members at their home. It's the people who grumble when the church talks about homosexuality and gender equality. We've been following all the church rules about sexuality and now you want to change them on us? It's a church member who gets upset when we don't take their idea to bring people to the church for another program and instead work in the community with programs that work for social change. It's in all of us, we all grumble. We're challenged by Jesus today to look in the mirror. Have you become ungrateful for what you've enjoyed? Have you become ungrateful for God's generosity for you? Have you fallen into a feeling of entitlement? The challenge of this week is to learn to appreciate what we have received from our generous God while celebrating God's generosity to others. This applies most especially to God's mercy and forgiveness and the welcome that God gives to all people to share in God's reign. Our last thing the parable teaches us is to see the world with God's eyes, to see creation through the eyes of the vineyard owner. The problem with the early arrivers in the vineyard has to do with how they see or fail to see the world around them. Where they could and should see a we, they see an us versus them. Where they could and should feel camaraderie, they feel contempt. Where they could and should see and celebrate a vineyard of God's grace, they see an arena of competition and a cause for resentment. Their whole way of seeing the world is distorted and obscured. Even the landowner's generosity itself appears as an occasion for division and scorn. Even though the early workers were beneficiaries of the same generosity of the landowner, they somehow managed to invent of them 
for us to look down on. And that, of course, is what lies in store for Jesus on the road to Golgotha. Our world is full of loss and suffering. It's full of us versus them. It's full of people and situations that tell us that we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and it's every man and woman for themselves. The world is full of things that Jesus speaks against. Instead, Jesus invites us to see the world with God's eyes. We're invited to see the world as a vineyard full of hard work, but also full of God's graceful gifts. It will be hard for us to see a grace-filled world. It will take profound trust and patience and insight and imagination. We need each other's help to do it, and that's what the church is. But most of all, we need God's help. When we begin to see as God sees, the wounds of creation can begin to heal. For when we see each other as beneficiaries of God's merciful gifts, equally unentitled, but equally beloved, the us versus them falls away. When we report that you've made him equal to us becomes a cause for celebration, not complaint, then what emerges in the end is an ever-widening we. We, the children of God, in one image of God. Then we will know the first will become last. As we seek to understand God's kingdom, let's rejoice in the generosity that God offers to us. We are loved by God, embraced by God, and welcomed by God. Whether you are new to the faith or grew up in the faith, you are loved and beloved. May you know that this day, and may you seek each day to share that generous love of God with others without grumbling. Amen and amen. How can we pray for you? We invite you to send in your prayer requests so that we can pray with and for you in the coming week. We invite you to send in your prayer requests in one of three ways. One, go to our website and fill out a prayer request form. Two, call our church office and press two to leave a message. Three, email us at volunteer at thumc.com. As we prepare for prayer, I invite you to join Stephanie in song as we invite God to hear our prayers.
I invite you now to go with me to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of unending mercy and steadfast love, we are grateful that you are slow to anger, for there is much in this world that is wrong and set against your purposes. Overcome our many injustices, O God, with your justice. Overtake our lust for revenge with your great mercy. We pray for nations locked in war to be set free from old patterns and to embrace a new way of relating. We pray for people who wield economic power to take notice of those whom you notice and to have compassion on those who are vulnerable. We pray for day laborers and the unemployed and the homeless. Inspire us who have enough to share what we have, not in measured and resentful amounts, but gladly, abundantly, so basic needs do not go unattended. Gather up the first and the last, the least and the greatest, into the common work of your kingdom, until there is no more first or last at all, for all are one in your name. O oh God, help us all to see not only your grace at work in the world, but also your humor at work among us, the holy laughter that heals us and helps us to see ourselves rightly. Thank you for the privilege of believing in Christ, of living in Christ, and of living for Christ. In all things, at all times, we give thanks to you, you who never lets us go. We pray all of this in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whether we have much or only a little, we can share our daily bread so that all will be fed. As we have received, so now we give. In the vineyard of the Lord are tithes and offerings. We have three ways you can give to the work of this church. One, give online at our website. Two, mail a check to our office. Three, stop in the office Monday from 9 to 12. We invite you to prepare your gifts to give as our music centers us. We give thanks for the gifts that God gives to all of us, including Donna's beautiful voice and Chuck Barnes's beautiful photos. Let us thank God together 
for what we have to offer. Let us pray. God of the harvest, we are privileged to be counted among those whom you have called, graced to have been given your work to do, and blessed to receive more than we will ever earn. Accept, we pray, our thanksgivings and our offerings, and do what you choose with what already belongs to you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. I invite you to sing God has freely given to us. Can you freely receive the generosity and the grace that God offers? Let's sing. As you go into your week, may the generous grace of Christ attend you. May the astounding love of God find you. And may the surprising movement of the Holy Spirit guide you everywhere and always. Go in peace. Amen.